Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140, Human Physiology. This is part five of the nervous system lectures. So in the last video, we looked at how action potentials actually occur and some characteristics of action potentials and, and also graded potentials. And we're going to continue looking at the nervous system in this video. So action potentials. We talked about how the amplitude of action potentials is the same every time. And so you cannot code information with intensity, with amplitude of signal. You must code it with frequency. So the frequency of action potential determines the perception of intensity. So we have our, our neuron sends the action potential, sends the action potential towards the axon terminal, towards the synapse. And then at the synapse, neurotransmitters are released into the synapse. Now, in a previous video, we talked about how that signal is terminated within the synapse, but there will, be a, there will be a rate at which that signal is terminated within the synapse once those neurotransmitters have been released into the synapse. The frequency at which those active potentials go down the axon, causing the release of neurotransmitters, will dictate the amount of neurotransmitter that is in the synapse at that time, which will dictate the intensity of the signal received on the other side of the synapse. So an increase in active frequency increases neurotransmitter release, which increases the signal being sent across that synapse. Action potential conduction velocity. So conduction or propagation of the action potential is unidirectional in, is unidirectional. It goes from cell body to axon. It's orthodromic and anterograde. Two vocab words we've seen in previous parts of this lecture. The speed at which the action potential propagates down the axon is different in different axons. Speed is influenced by insulation or the presence of myelin. The fiber size, so the diameter, not the length, the diameter, and temperature. And temperature. So you can see some examples here. You know, we have large neurons which conduct their signals fast, and we have small neurons which conduct them slow. We're not gonna to get too much into the different types of nerve fibers in this video. So conduction, propagation is unidirectional, perfect. All right, so expect a couple questions on what can affect the velocity of a, an action potential, the speed at which it's sent. So fiber size, the larger the fiber, the faster, or the larger the diameter, the faster it's sent. So why is there a picture of a giant squid on this slide? Well, giant squids are actually really interesting for a lot of reasons. One reason that they're really interesting to physiologists is that one giant axon from a squid is 0.8 millimeters in diameter. So giant squid, one way, they're, they're big animals, and one way that they speed up communication within their bodies is they have evolved really large diameter nerves. 0.8 millimeters, you don't need a microscope to see that. Like 0.8 millimeters, you can just see. Like that's huge. So that's just an example of how larger, larger diameters increases the speed at which it's sent. Insulation of myelin. So we talked a lot about myelin in part one and part two of this series of videos. And we're gonna look 
shortly, we're going to look at how exactly myelin increases the rate. So not all nerve fibers have myelin, but myelin will increase the rate. Temperature makes sense. The higher the temperature, the faster everything's moving, the faster we get conduction. So right here. So conduction is faster in myelinated axons. So myelin uh, currently slows conduction. Myelin insulates and prevents current leaks. So where myelin is wrapping around, so the way myelin works is it'll cover a part of the axon and then it'll have a space without myelin called a node of Von Vier. Um, I, don't, I think it's a French word, I don't speak French, so I'm not pronouncing that wrong. Um, but you have myelin covering a section and then you have what myelin not covering a section. And those, non, those sections are called nodes of Von Vier. Those are the sections where ions are able to go in and out of the axon. So the myelin insulates sections of the axon. And what this leads to is it leads to something called saltatory conduction, where the action potential jumps from node of Ron VA to node of Ron VA. It's able to basically skip over those parts where the myelin is, where, so allowing it to move faster down the axon. Uh, an analogy could be using the tab button to move across a word doc or the space button. You just go faster per unit time. You jump over whole sections. Now, you know me, I'm really, I think it's really important to understand where words come from and understand how the, the basically knowing the origin of words and knowing the, the prefixes, suffixes, and being able to break words down into their, their origin parts allows you a better understanding. It makes it easier to memorize those terms and understand those terms. So saltatory conduction. For anybody who speaks Spanish, saltar means to jump. So it's, it literally it means jumping conduction. It literally means jump. Saltatory conduction, saltar means to jump. Um, I like entomology, and there's a, a group of spiders called the Salticidae spiders, and they're the jumping spiders. Yes, there's a family of spiders called jumping spiders. Horrifying, I know. Um, but Salticidae is jumping, saltar, Salticidae. Saltatory conduction, jumping action potentials. Hopefully that helps you remember this. So the autonomic nervous system works below the level of consciousness. Now we're moving back into the, uh, we're gonna start the efferent nervous system section of this lecture. And remember the efferent nervous system has two main components. One of those main components is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is broken up into two main parts, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Uh, we've talked about these a number of times throughout the semester, so I'm going to kind of jump over some of these sections, the, the review sections, fairly quickly. So the sympathetic nervous system is the fight-or-flight nervous system. It, and by fight-or-flight, we mean that it, the things that the sympathetic nervous system, so remember, these are, these are effectors. The, the efferent nervous system affects change. And the changes that the sympathetic nervous system causes are changes that prepare a person to fight something or run from something, to fight a bear or run from a bear. The sympathetic nervous system, the changes that it affects are changes that promote resting and digesting. Another way to remember it, Po, the Kung Fu Panda, fighting foes, sympathetic dominant, Po eating foe, like the soup, parasympathetic. So the autonomic nervous system works below the level of consciousness. You can't think, I want to constrict my blood vessels and think really hard and make it happen. You can't think, you know, 
I want to sweat more. Oh, I want to sweat less. Oh, you know, and make it happen. It happens below the level of consciousness. And remember about tonic control from our, our last series of lectures. There's always some level of stimulation coming from the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Uh, there's always some frequency at which those signals are being sent, but that frequency can, you know, it can increase or decrease depending on the situation. So when you exercise, sympathetic is dominant. There's a higher frequency of, there's a high frequency of sympathetic signals being sent. When you are eating avocado toast and resting in the morning, Parasympathetic has a higher frequency, it's more dominant. Both are always active to varying degrees, tonic control. Now, in most situations, these two branches work antagonistically. One increases heart rate, one decreases heart rate, for example. But not always, but not always. So we're gonna look, we've already learned about uh, one example where they don't work antagonistically, like sweat glands. Sweat glands are exclusively innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So there's no parasympathetic working in the opposite. Another example of a exception to the rule is the salivary response. Both branches of the autonomic nervous system contribute to the salivary response. So both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system increases the salivary response. Remember this is Pavlov's dogs. Dual control requires innervation by both autonomic nervous system branches. So dual innervation is when one part of the body is innervated by both the autonomic, uh, sorry, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branches. So the nodes of the heart, the nodes of the heart have both have dual innervation. They're innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers, uh, the nervous system. And sympathetic increases heart rate, parasympathetic decreases heart rate. Certain tissues are exclusively controlled by one branch. So the example we've seen so far is sweat glands. But there's actually a number of different branches that have mono innervation or single branch of the autonomic nervous system that goes to that target area. You can see here that the parasympathetic goes to the SA node, goes to the AV node. Those are the parts of the heart that set heart rate. So heart rate is dual innervated. But look at where all the sympathetic fibers go. They go to the, the nodes. They also go to the ventricles. They also go to the ventricles. So ventricles are mono innervated. Adipose tissue. What is adipose tissue? Fat tissue. Mono innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Adrenal glands. Uh, we'll actually learn some really cool things about the adrenal glands uh, coming up shortly. So adrenal glands, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, blood vessels, mono innervated by sympathetic nervous system. Erector pili muscles, the things that make your hair stand up, give you goosebumps, sympathetic nervous system only. We have one example for mono innervation of the parasympathetic nervous system, that's your lacrimal gland. So this picture right here, uh, what can you tell me about this guy's autonomic nervous system? Looks like he's sweating a lot. He probably has a very active sympathetic nervous system right now. He's probably pretty nervous. So afferent and efferent fibers contact the central nervous system in unique locations. Afferent and efferent fibers contact the central nervous system in unique locations locations. This is called the bell mangadi law. The bell mangadi law. So afferent fibers contact the central, the spinal cord on the dorsal side, on the dorsal side. Efferent fibers 
contact the central nervous system on the ventral side, the ventral side. Um, I want to point something out. Uh, um, I want to point something out. So I've actually mentioned this before. And if you listen back a few lectures, uh, this next part might sound kind of weird, but I talked about, when I was talking about myelination, I talked about how my, my dentist uh, told me all about eating brains and about how when you eat, when you eat in his country where he's from, he, they eat brain, like sheep brain. And he said that it's really, really fatty. And it's fatty because of all the myelinated fibers that are in it. And it talks about how the white matter, if you've ever heard about the white matter or gray matter in someone's brain, that the white matter is myelinated axons because myelination is really fatty. And that the gray matter are nerve cell bodies, nerve cell bodies, dendrites, and unmyelinated axons. Well, here it is coming up again. Um, you actually see this in the, in the uh, spinal cord also, where you have white matter and gray matter. White matter is myelinated axons, fatty myelinated axons. Gray matter are cell bodies, dendrites, and unmyelinated axons. The branches of the autonomic nervous system can be distinguished anatomically, can be distinguished anatomically. So the sympathetic nervous system has unique anatomic characteristics that are different than the unique anatomic characteristics from the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the bracholumbar. So break the word down, brachial is the Latin spine, lumbar is your lumbar spine. You're going to find the cell body of the sympathetic nervous system in these brachial lumbar regions, the Latin lumbar spine region. This tree can serve the people generally on the space to the First off, we need to speak the language of physiologists of healthcare, ganglia. Ganglia is a group of parasympathetic, sorry, peripheral nervous system, peripheral nervous system cell bodies. A ganglia is a group of peripheral nervous system cell bodies. I want to cover the two fiber rule and then I'm going to go back a couple slides. So anatomic pathways typically have two neurons in series. So in your autonomic nervous system, you're gonna have a cell body in your central nervous system, a preganglionic neuron that's gonna have an axon that goes to an autonomic ganglion, or the ganglion's a group of, of peripheral nervous system cell bodies. So you have one fiber that goes from the central nervous system to a ganglion, and then one fiber that goes from the ganglion to the target tissue, the two fiber rule. Preganglionic cell is central nervous system to ganglion, postganglionic is ganglion to target tissue. So it's gonna be like that for the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So in the sympathetic nervous system, are pre and paravertebral ganglia. So we have a cell body in the central nervous system, the spinal cord, thracolumbar region, and that preganglionic fiber is gonna to go to a ganglion that's anatomically really close to the spinal cord. So if you remember back to anatomy class, if you remember back to anatomy, in the sympathetic chain ganglia right here. I remember seeing those in cadaver lab. I remember those in anatomy class very clearly. So we have a short, pre um, a short um, preganglionic fiber, a ganglionic fiber that goes from the central nervous system to the ganglion and the sympathetic nervous system that's short. And then from the ganglion to the tissue that it affects, the target tissue is long. 
in the parasympathetic nervous system, it's considered craniosacral. I'll break it down, cranium sacrum. So these cell bodies are gonna be in the, uh, the cranium, the, the, the brainstem, and in the sacrum. They're gonna have long preganglionic fibers and then short postganglionic fibers. So the ganglia for the parasympathetic nervous system are close to the tissues that they're going to affect. Perfect. Autonomic nervous system axons make numerous synapses with target cells. So that classic picture of an axon with a synapse, synapsing with a target cell, it can happen a little bit differently in the autonomic nervous system. These things call varicosities. So these axons are able to form many, many synapses with its target tissue. Each one of these little bubbles is called a varicosity. And when the action potential comes down and goes through these varicosities, each one of these varicosities is able to release neurotransmitters onto the target cell. So they're able to just bathe these tissues with neurotransmitters. Varicosities release neurotransmitters over the surface of target cells. So it's not just a one axon to one cell thing. It's one axon to many varicosities just bathing the tissue in neurotransmitters. Two neurotransmitters predominate in the peripheral nervous system. We have acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Now, if you remember back to Hans postulates, different, uh, a, a single chemical, a single transmitter can have a different effect on different tissues. And what, what gives you the effect is the receptor type the receptor that binds to that signal. So let's take a look at the two main neurotransmitters in the peripheral nervous system. We've got acetylcholine or ACH, and we've got norepinephrine or NE. The receptors for acetylcholine are considered to be cholinergenic, and there's nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Norepinephrine, those receptors are called, considered androgenic. And we have alpha ones, alpha twos, beta ones, and beta twos. All right, so let's look at this anatomy a little more closely. So characteristics of efferent neural circuits. So we have preganglionic cell body location, central nervous system. Preganglionic axon length, so it's the length of the axon that goes to the ganglion. Preganglionic neurotransmitters, I want you to know the neurotransmitters and the receptors at this spot. We then have postganglionic axon length, so the length of the axon that goes from the ganglion to target tissue. And then the neurotransmitters and receptors there, targets and effects. So let's look at this. Parasympathetic branches have long preganglionic fibers. So where are the cell bodies in the parasympathetic nervous system? The parasympathetic nervous system cell bodies, like we said a handful of slides ago, are craniosacral. They're in the brainstem, the cranium, and they're in the sacrum. They have long preganglionic fibers that go to the ganglion, and ganglions that are close to the tissues that they're going to affect. We're going to have nicotinic receptors at this ganglion location, and acetylcholine is going to be the neurotransmitter. The postganglionic fiber is short. The neurotransmitter again is acetylcholine at the target tissue, and the receptors are muscarinic receptors. Target cardiac muscle, smooth muscle glands. Effects, effects. So these are vocab words right here, giving you a heads up. These are vocab words for this lecture. And you're also gonna see them again when we talk about 
the circulatory system. So the parasympathetic nervous system, it decreases heart rate, chronotropy. Chronotropy refers to heart rate as a negative chronotropy is gonna decrease heart rate. It has negative inotropy. Inotropy refers to the contraction strength. So how hard does the heart contract? And negative dromotropy. Dromotropy refers to conduction velocity or how fast does that, that muscle action potential travel through the heart? So parasympathetic has negative chronotropy, negative inotropy, and negative dromotropy. Sympathetic branches have long postganglionic fibers. So in the sympathetic nervous system, where's a cell body? Well, like we said a handful of slides ago, it's thracolumbar. It's in the uh, thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. The preganglionic fibers are short. The ganglion are close to the central nervous system. The neurotransmitter at the ganglion is acetylcholine and the receptors are nicotinic. We're going to have long postganglionic fibers. And when those fibers form the synapse with the target muscle, we're going to have norepinephrine. Norepinephrine be the neurotransmitter, and the receptors are going to be androgenic receptors. Norepinephrine, androgenic target, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle glands. Sympathetic neurotransmitters interact with a variety of receptors. So if we come up here, back a few slides, we'll see that there's four main types of these androgenic receptors, four main types. So the receptor type is gonna dictate what this, these norepinephrine molecules, uh, the effects they cause. It's gonna depend on the receptor. So let's take a look at some of the effects of those receptors. So let's start with alpha-1. So alpha-1 is going to be on systemic blood vessels, and it's going to cause vasoconstriction. So norepinephrine goes across the synapse, binds onto alpha-1, causes vasoconstriction. Beta-1s are going to be in the cardiac muscle, and when norepinephrine binds with beta-1, it's going to lead to positive chronotropy, so increased heart rate, positive inotropy, so strength of contraction, positive dromotrophy, speed at which those, that action potential, that muscle action potential propagates. Beta-2, location is going to be systemic and coronary blood vessels, bronchioles. Effect is vaso and bronchiodilation. So, when norepinephrine binds to a beta-2, it causes systemic and coronary blood vessels and bronchioles to dilate. Now let's go back to alpha-2. So alpha-1, alpha beta-1, and beta-2 are all on the target cell. They all have an effect on the target cell. Alpha-2s are a little different. Alpha-2s are actually on the axon, on the nerve that releases the norepinephrine. They're on right here on the nerve that releases the, uh, the norepinephrine. And when norepinephrine binds in alpha-2, it actually inhibits more norepinephrine from being released. So it's kind of like a feedback loop. It's feedback inhibition. Feedback inhibition. Norepinephrine binds the alpha-2 on that same cell, prevents more norepinephrine from being released. Or, so it prevents... Uh, norepinephrine release, it's a feedback inhibition loop. Sympathetic non-ganglionic pathways involve a single neuron, involve a single neuron. So this is like a special case. And uh, I'm gonna tell you about a certain type of tumor that's gonna, well, actually, I'm gonna dive a little deep into this one. because I think it's an interesting case. So sympathetic non-ganglionic pathways, so, so no ganglion. Non-ganglionic, no ganglion pathways involve a single neuron. So cell body is gonna be in the thracolumbar region. Non-ganglionic, single fiber, so central nervous system to the target. So 
with regards to our adrenal medulla, we have a nerve cell body, a sympathetic nerve cell body in our central nervous system. And it has an axon that goes directly to the adrenal medulla. It's considered non-ganglionic. It's going to release acetylcholine. It's going to bind to nicotinic receptors. And it's going to cause the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine into our bloodstream. Into our bloodstream. It's considered non-ganglionic. The adrenal medulla, the adrenal gland, is going to release adrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine into our bloodstream. Neurohormone, epinephrine, norepinephrine into our bloodstream, which is going to go have effects throughout the body. The cells that release these are called chromaffin cells. Chromaffin cells affects neurohormone release. So these chromaffin cells are actually modified postganglionic nerve cells. There's a tumor called a pheochromocytoma, which means gray colored tumor. And it's called a gray colored tumor because it's made up of gray matter, like nervous system gray matter. What is nervous system gray matter? It's nerve cell body. So if we come back up here, gray matter is cell body and dendrites. Well, a pheochromocytoma is a tumor of chromaffin cells. And it's called a gray colored tumor. It's called a gray colored tumor because the chromaffin cells are modified postganglionic sympathetic neuron cells. Um, pheochromocytomas are, are actually kind of crazy. Um, they cause a huge increase in the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which leads to like super high blood pressures and heart rates and not good stuff. Uh, luckily with modern medicine, we can take care of them pretty easily. So that's a good thing. So it's considered non-ganglionic, but really the chromaffin cells are modified post-ganglionic cells. And instead of having an axon that synapses directly with something, they just release their transmitter, their epinephrine, norepinephrine into the bloodstream. It becomes a neurotransmitter. Somatic neurons directly innervate skeletal muscles. So the cell body, for so remember this is um, with our efferent nervous system, we have our two main branches, with the autonomic and the somatic. Well, somatic neurons directly innervate skeletal muscle. The cell body is in the central nervous system, in the cerebral cortex or ventral gray horn. There's no ganglion, it's one fiber, and they go, they synapse directly with skeletal muscle. They release acetylcholine, acetylcholine binds onto a nicotinic receptor, and it causes skeletal muscle contraction. Here's your summary chart where we have the somatic pathway, parasympathetic, sympathetic, and the adrenal sympathetics the non-ganglionic pathway. Here it is in a different fashion. And I'm going to stop this video right here. I will see you in the next, the final nervous system video next. If you have any questions, please let me know. Remember, I am here to help. Have a great day.